I am absolutely thrilled to announce that in the not too distant future, we have two events and there is something for everyone. Now, first up on the docket, we have our 12th annual Plant Stock Weekend Celebration. This is going to be a virtual event and it is incredibly affordable. I hope that you'll join us. We have Dr. Michael Greger speaking to us all about his new book, How Not to Age. And the whole theme of this year's Plant Stock is coming together around food. And in that spirit, we have assembled the most insane list of Brockstar chefs that you can imagine. We've got Max Lamana, who's an award-winning author, social media sensation, and incredible chef. We have got some of your tried and true favorites like Chef AJ. We have Kim Campbell. We have the other social media sensation, Carly Bodrug. We have Cameron Clements, Mrs. Plant-Based on a Budget, Tony Akamoto, the incredible registered dietitian, Desiree Nielsen, Kiki Nelson, Shane Martin, Jackie Ackerberg, Janet Verney, the list goes on. And of course, Jane and Ann Esselstyn and, and my father. Now, the other event that we have coming up in October, from October 9th to the 14th, it is our live Sedona retreat. It's a life-changing event. Highly recommend that anyone looking to take a deep dive with 80 to 90 other people in this very remote location in the austere Red Rock Mountains uh, outside Sedona, Arizona, you do not want to miss this. We've been putting these on now for close to 13 years, and this Sedona retreat is one of my absolute favorites. We're talking unlimited buffets of plant-strong food, yoga, world-class lectures, stargazing, bonfires, pickleball, and all kinds of wonderful bonding and camaraderie. All right, I hope to see you at either or both in the not-too-distant future. Whether it's Plant Stock or whether it's Sedona, for either one, simply go to plantstrong.com and then click on either 12th Annual Plant Stock or Sedona Retreat 2023. And I hope to see you at either or both. You can't go wrong. I'm Rip Esselstyn, and welcome to the Plant Strong Podcast. The mission at Plant Strong is to further the advancement of all things within the plant based movement. We advocate for the scientifically proven benefits of plant based living and envision a world that universally understands, promotes, and prescribes plants as a solution to empowering your health, enhancing your performance, restoring the environment, and becoming better guardians to the animals we share this planet with. We welcome you wherever you are on your Plan Strong journey, and I hope that you enjoy the show. This week's episode of the Plan Strong podcast is about going all in on your passions. Dr. Sandra Musil is board certified in pediatrics and obesity medicine and was in private practice for over 13 years in lovely Providence, Rhode Island. She also taught at Brown University for 11 years until 2021 when she decided to give up private practice, break out of her comfort zone, and go all in with what she loves most, which is helping people transition to a whole food plant-based lifestyle. She and two other plant-based physicians started Plant Docs Providence to provide classes, education, and consultations to the public and medical professionals about how whole food plant-based nutrition can prevent, improve, and reverse chronic diseases such as type 2 diabetes, obesity, heart disease, and certain cancers. This career transition has not come without risk. But when you pursue what you believe, the risk also comes with high reward when you know you're making a difference in the lives of many, many people. Please welcome to the Plant Strong Podcast, Dr. Sandy Musial. 
Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Plant Strong Podcast. We have got Dr. Sandy. And Dr. Sandy, uh, help me. What is your last name? Museal. Okay. And where does that originate from? Oh, good question. Um, Ukraine, actually. Um, my three, um, my father and his two brothers came over, immigrated from Ukraine, and their name was Musialowski. Wow. And, you know, that wasn't cool back in the, you know, early 1900s. So they chopped off the Owski and they were left with Musial. <laughs> well, do you still have relatives over in the Ukraine? I do. All my second cousins are over there. And how are they holding up? Do you know? They're doing okay. They're all in Western Ukraine, fortunately, mm. where there's um, less aggression from Russia. Um, so, but it's not, you know, it's not fun. I think there's trouble with electricity and jobs and money and food and yeah. Yeah. I can't even imagine. Have you ever been over to the Ukraine? I have. I am um, in 2000 nine, my sister and I went to find our family and meet everybody. And we stayed with them. It was awesome. Wow. Is it a big family or small? Yeah, it was. Well, it was just my mother's mother's family that we visited. And we found the house where my grandmother was born and her mother's grave. It was very powerful, way more than either of us expected. Um, we often just felt tearful for no reason. And we just felt this incredible connection to our roots. Mm. And, you know, along the plant strong line, um, everyone grows food there for, you know, sustenance farming because they, they have to. They don't have, a, even before the war, they didn't have a lot of money. Even my cousin, who's a surgeon over there in a small public community hospital, they're not paid very much at all because they're government paid jobs. So they have, you know, grapevines in the front yard um, and all kinds of vegetables and fruit trees throughout their yard. And my sister and I are both just born farmers. We love to grow organic um, vegetables and fruit. And when we went there, we were just like, ah, it all makes sense now. <laughs> That's really, really bravo to you that you went over there to, to, to do all that. Um, so your, your immediate family, you come from, um, so your mother and father, where did you guys grow up? Um, around the Boston area. My, um, all four of my grandparents were born in Ukraine and came over, um, and somehow they all ended up in the Boston area. And there's a Ukrainian church there, which was often you know, the focus of community and gathering. So it's the um, St. Andrew's Ukrainian Church of Boston. And yeah. so that they all met each other and married other Ukrainians. So that's how I ended up being 100% Ukrainian. How many brothers and sisters do you have, Sandy? I have two brothers and one sister. Mm -hmm. And are you the only one that went into medicine? Yeah. Um, later in life, my sister became a respiratory therapist. And so she's um, in the medical field as well now. Got but it. yeah, no, no other doctors um, except the generation below me. There's some emerging doctors. <laughs> uh -huh. Very cool. And what was it that initially drew you to medicine? Um, I think, you know, it, it, it layered up, but it started with, um, I would say my father was a very big influence um, to me. He's very analytical. We're very similar in that way. And his brother died of a sudden heart attack at a very young age. And it was an older brother. But I think my father, you know, knew enough to put the pieces together, like, well, what are the risks for heart attack? And I don't want that to happen to me. And so he started subscribing to Prevention Magazine and talking about it a lot with the family and making changes at home. So we stopped, you know, eating red meat and stopped, told my mother to get rid of the fry later and stop making fried chicken and, <laughs> and some things that, you know, maybe weren't um, great, like, oh, let's eat more margarine. You know, we just didn't know. But I think his interest in that, you know, really piqued my interest in how the food that you eat is related to health and health outcomes. So that's what led me to study nutritional sciences in college. And I thought originally I wanted to become a dietitian or a nutritionist, 
which is funny because it's kind of what I am now. <laughs> yeah. Full circle. <laughs> and so you ended up going into medicine. You went to medical school where at the University of Massachusetts, is that right? Correct. Yeah. Yep. And then from there, uh, did you, what did you get your, like, uh, your residency or internship in? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I was kind of torn between family medicine and pediatrics. I, I wanted to do prevention. Like, that's something that always just was a philosophical thread throughout my life that was very important. And, you know, originally I thought... I. I can just do like nutrition and influence people with nutrition. But then when I got out of college and I went to look at what jobs were actually available, I was really disappointed that you don't really have much control, especially as a new graduate. I was going to be working in the kitchen of a hospital or at some weight loss clinic that seemed ridiculous to me. And so I ended up taking a job in research and realizing if I become a doctor, I'll have a little bit more or a lot more influence um, over kind of diet and health. So that's what led me into medical school. I fell in love with the pediatric population. And from there, I became a pediatrician. And I spent the first 13 years of my career in private practice. Um, taking care of kids with five other pediatricians in the southern part of Rhode Island. But I was kind of feeling like I'm just influencing people one at a time, and I'd like to have more of an influence by maybe being a teacher of uh, rising you know, doctors and medical students. So I left my private practice to work at um, Brown University's teaching hospital, um, Children's children, Hasbro Children's Hospital in Providence, and I was teaching the yeah, residents. What year was that? What year was that? Um, that was 2010. Okay. And so when did you, I'm just trying to get, I'm trying to get this wrapped around my brain here. So how long were you in pedi pediatric medicine before you um, went to Brown? Um, I was, you know, four years in training and then um, 13 years as a private pediatrician. Okay. And then at Brown, 11 years doing the teaching. Wow. And you said that you loved uh, pediatrics. What is it that you love about pediatrics? Um, I love the innocence of, of the little children. And I love babies. And um, I love and the parents. I was very compassionate um, toward the parents. I could, I just, I'm a parent myself. Those are my boys. Uh -huh, anyway. uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> and uh, the... I could just like understand the, uh, the concern and the, the, um, the pain and, you know, what parents are going through. And I, I loved holding their hands and helping them navigate parenthood and even like the little, you know, challenges of, of mild illnesses in children. I never got tired of talking about um, discipline and potty training and breastfeeding. It, um, so I loved all that and I really missed leaving it, but I just wanted a, another chapter in my life professionally. Yeah. Was there, so in those first couple decade or so, was there one thing that you saw more than any other as a pediatric uh, practitioner? I mean, I think well child care is kind of the bread and butter of pediatrics, seeing kids for their well visits and you see babies more than than older kids because older kids come in once a year and babies come in all the time <laughs> yeah so um i loved that but as far as like pathology it was you know the ear infections asthma um were the probably the most common pathological yeah. conditions that yeah we of. yeah and 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 looking back on it is it is it fair to say that a lot of these ear infections may have been contributed to by dairy. And yeah, it's possible. Uh, yeah. It, it's hard to know. Um, it was um, a really, you know, fascinating time. I, I was kind of struggling, like at the same time that I was doing this and, and seeing, you know, it starts to get a little repetitious, you know, when you're seeing the same thing over and over again. But at the same time, one of the moms who was a very educated, she was a, a pediatric intensive care unit nurse, 
and had two children that she was bringing to me. And she asked me if I had read the China study and that her doctor had told her to read it and that she should stop giving her children milk. And that's what kind of started me down this pathway of plant-based nutrition, but at the same time feeling um, this conflict with my career, with the American Academy of Pediatrics teaching us that milk is good and milk is important and you have to tell everyone to have it three times a day for strong bones. So like I had that like ground into my brain and yeah. then I'm reading this new information and feeling like, well, why are they separate? You know, and, and it, it still eludes me now. <laughs> Cause they ha and this was years and years ago now, like when the China study came out, what is it like 15 years ago or more? Um, well, the China study came out in 2005. Yeah. And so it, that started me down this path of, I already had this, you know, interest in nutrition and, and was, I had studied it as an undergraduate. So I just started seeing the movies and watching and reading the books, kind of like anyone else, doctor or not doctor. That's where I was getting this new information and the studies that were coming out. And I just felt like, I really want to do this. This is um, very interesting. And I gave the book, the China study to my brother. This is, you know, I'm still working along as a pediatrician, but I'm starting to educate the adults around me about this. And my brother's eight years older than me, and he had high blood pressure and high cholesterol, was about 50 pounds overweight, living in Colorado, kind of meat and potatoes, tough guy. And he read it on a, on a trip to Florida. He, he like opened the book and he said, by the time he landed, you know, of course he was only a, a little bit into the book. He was convinced yeah. he had like read enough. And he, you know, he called me from Florida and was like, you know, my neighbor just died of a heart attack and I knew I had to do something. I didn't know what it was, but this is it. And it changed his life. He's been doing it ever since I gave him that book. He lost 50 pounds within the first year. He, dropped his cholesterol and blood pressure, never needed to take the meds. And, you know, he, last summer he hiked the Colorado trail. He's, you know, just become very healthy guy. So I feel like I, he was the kind of person in my life that as a result of me educating him and the influence I had over him was pivotal in me wanting to help more people that were my age and to not have a heart attack and to not have to go on blood pressure meds or um, statins. Well, I think that that says a lot about your relationship with your brother too, that you could say, Hey, you should check out this book and he reads it and he makes these lifestyle changes and it's sticking to, to this day. That's pretty powerful stuff. Yeah. It was very powerful. And then for you to be able to see firsthand the results of somebody that close to you and what can happen when you, you know, embrace this lifestyle. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And then shortly after that, you'll like this story. Um, your dad, Essie and Colin Campbell and your mom, <laughs> that's funny to refer to them like yeah. that, yeah. Um, did a weekend at Kripalu, which is like this yoga retreat in Western Mass. And I brought my sister, my niece and my father-in-law and they were all interested, but not like completely all in or on board. But after that weekend, all four of us, you know, it was just so energizing to mm -hmm. see the three of them with all this amazing data and influence. And to me, they were like, um, you know, it's not just a fad or, you know, some book. This was like medical data that they were sharing. And I felt like this is, you know, well credentialed and valid. And um, my father in law has been doing it. All of us have been, you know, eating really healthy ever since. But my father in law has like reversed aged since <laughs> that weekend. He's turning 80 next year and he just looks, no, I'm sorry. He's turning 90 next year and he looks like 70 something. He just, it's incredible. And he's, he's a big fan. <laughs> well, <clears throat> hey. <laughs> yeah, it's nice when you can reverse the aging process. <laughs> that, 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 that's something that we all would like, I think. Uh, so this is so super exciting. Uh, the China study. And so did you read that like the year it came out or was it introduced to you a couple of years later? I think it was a couple of years later when that patient told me about it. And 
Um, and then I was, cause I thought she was talking about some kind of research paper, which she, I didn't realize it was a book. And yeah. then when I finally like figured it all out and it was coming at me from like different directions, I kept hearing about it. I'm like, I got to read this book. And yeah, that was the, the pivotal book for me. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, it, so many people, the China study was kind of the, uh, the gateway book <laughs> into, into the lifestyle for sure. Yeah. So, um, and so you were at, you're at Brown doing something there. Tell me what, what, uh, and you were there until what, 2020, 2021, 21, 21. And what was it? Was it there that you started a, um, kind of obesity clinic? Yeah. So I, you know, I, being there, I wanted to have do more with nutrition. So I did a lot of nutrition education and making materials for the residents and the medical students. Um, and obviously pediatric obesity is, is becoming and has been becoming a big epidemic. And I just felt like we weren't doing enough to address it, but not just kids who have obesity, but all the children in our clinic um, were, are just yeah, you know, they're the in inner city, very poor kids eating horrifically <laughs> nutrient deficient diets. And most of them are getting, you know, getting too much weight, overweight, obese, um, you know, maybe 40% of the kids in our clinic. So with um, another colleague of mine, Dr. Corcoran, we both got board certified in obesity medicine and started this obesity clinic for children called Health Clinic, Healthy Eating, Active Living through Hasbro. It's a little acronym. <laughs> and, what's, and, and what's Hasbro? What, what's Hasbro that? is the name of the children's hospital because the Hasbro toy company is oh. from Rhode Island and they funded a lot of the hospital. So it's named after them. Oh, well, that's a very... Um, Clever and catchy acronym, health. Yes. yes. <laughs> right. Because we wanted the focus to be on health and wellness, not like your, your weight. It's yeah. about getting healthy. But um, that training in obesity medicine was mostly a, an adult specialty in medicine. So I felt like it was giving me, because I was trying to think, how how am I going to start treating adults? How can I do this more with adults when I'm a pediatrician? I felt like I picked the wrong profession and I really wanted to help more people like my brother and other people that I had helped that were adults, friends, and family. Mm -hmm. So it was after that training that I realized I, I can work with adults now because I have this board certification in obesity medicine. And it's not like I'm doing hospital medicine. I'm doing nutrition education. Uh, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I want, I want to get to where you are today, but before, before we do, I still want to dig in a little bit sure. with this, this obesity, um, medicine that you, that you started. Um, so you, did you say that almost what 40% of the children that were coming in were kind of overweight or obese, mm -hmm. Is that about right? So almost, almost 50%. And what is your definition of somebody that's a, a child that you were seeing as a pediatric um, practitioner. What's the age range? Oh, um, well, the kids in our, the whole clinic are birth to 18, but in the obesity clinic, we would start seeing them at three. Three. Uh, three to 18. And so, hmm. and so a three-year-old comes to you and you can just, and they're, they're just, they're, they're overweight at three. Right. So we, you know, in all of pediatrics, we track weights, heights, and head circumferences, and we do it as percentiles. You know, the, the BMI is a, a, we define obesity and overweight as a percentile of kind of what a healthy weight is. So anything from the 85th to the 95th percentile is considered overweight in children, and anything over the 95th percentile is considered obesity. It's a medical definition. Yeah. And, and so if somebody was to come to you because you started this obesity clinic, mm -hmm. you're just seeing basically obese, uh, pediatric patients all day long. Rough. Is that, is that accurate? Well, I was doing, I wore several hats. So I worked in an urgent care, like with sick children and the residents would see the sick patients and then they would come, we call it precept. They would come to us and we would precept them like, hear the case, double check the exam, 
help them learn which antibiotics or what the appropriate treatment is, what the education is. Or I also worked in the, the well child clinic. Um, and this is where the residents practice to be pediatricians. So they have their own panel of patients um, mm. that they follow for three years. And we oversee them in that role as well. So as their interns, the first year residents, they need a lot of overseeing and double checking. But by the time they're third years, they're, they're working very independently and ready to go off on their own. Mm -hmm. And so in addition, I had another day where I was doing the obesity medicine. And it would be the children from these other clinics that would get referred by the residents to work um, to be seen in the um, obesity clinic. Got it. And were you, were you able to have success? Because I would imagine that the parents would be there with the, or the mother or the father uh, or both with uh, the child. And then are you trying to say, listen, it's just really as simple as, you know, eating these foods. Did they, could you get any traction or buy-in? It was variable. So there were some people that were unaware that their children were an unhealthy weight and hadn't paid it much attention. And when you bring it to their attention and you kind of go over what a healthy diet is, like, you know, is your child getting five fruits and vegetables every day and you, you go through their diet and realize they're getting zero to one a day? Or, you know, how many, how many whole grains is your child getting compared to processed foods? And, you know, then it doesn't, it didn't take a lot for some parents to just steer them in the right direction and educate them. Some people didn't realize um, like how much sugar is in apple juice, for example. Uh, it says no sugar added on the bottle and, and well-meaning parents think it's healthy. It's also provided by WIC, you know, the program that provides food for um, low-income families. So if the government's telling them they should be giving their child this every day, isn't it good for them? You know, but then, so I, I think there was a lot of education. We made these bottles like with apple juice and soda, ginger ale, Gatorade, and then put the sugar in the bottle. Yeah. And, and then when parents would hold those bottles and see the sugar, they would be like, oh my God, I had no idea. And so we did a lot of um, like concrete- That's that was really um, smart so they can actually see it. Yeah, it's wow. powerful. And so for some families, that that's the kind of education we did. It was kind of activity based. Another example is we would show them how to read labels, like how much fat is in a McDonald's um, French fry or chicken nugget. And then you calculate um, what that looks like as far as tablespoons. And then we would make these fat sandwiches with kids with graham crackers and spread the fat on it. You know, they don't eat them. <laughs> it's just to like say, right. like, would you want to eat this lard mm -hmm. and, you know, using Crisco? Mm -hmm. So like that was. So give me, give me, give me an example of like, for example, uh, I don't know, a Burger King Whopper. Do you know how many teaspoons or tablespoons <laughs> of lard you would be putting on a cracker? Can you remember? <laughs> I can't remember. I would say it's probably three to for for that big one, probably three to five tablespoons. Tablespoons. Yeah, I can't remember for yeah, sure, but yeah. it it was because um, we were doing more like the chicken nuggets and small French fry. You know what a younger child would eat was was a, probably close to three. So <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, it's a lot, and when you when you realize. When you, it, it helps them give meaning. So then if they're looking at a label and it says, you know, it has 12 grams of fat, they could see what that, how that translates into, you know, a visual cue. So, yeah, you know, I think when someone like when a three to, you know, I don't know where the cutoff is, eight to 10 year old comes in, the onus is on the parents to take ownership of what their child's eating, what they're buying at the market, what they're feeding them. There were some families that didn't really get that and would, would take a step back. They'd be on their phone saying, tell my kid to stop eating potato chips, you know, <laughs> and it, it doesn't, doesn't work like that. You know, it, yeah. it's a family affair. So sometimes there were families like that, but the children were older, like teenagers and the parents were hands off. Maybe they're working all day. Um, they have issues and problems of their own and they, um, you know, so it, it gets really complicated, right? But some of those kids would come in on their own, 
like take a bus and come to the clinic and really want to know, like, how can I get healthier? And, and I would see them regularly. Yeah. I have a friend that practices pediatric medicine, um, in Boston. Um, and it's to a lower socioeconomic group of demographic demographics. And he said, it's just so absolutely heart wrenching the the level of the obesity that he sees and he told me the other day he saw a 14 year he's a 14 and 12 year old brother brothers the 12 year old was already over 250 pounds and the 14 year old was in the 300s and was interested in having breast reduction surgery because yeah. so many of the kids at school were making fun making of making fun of them yeah yeah i just i'm just like oh that is just so so painful. Yeah. And then there's the children that have fatty liver disease, um, type two diabetes, high cholesterol. These, you know, these should be adult diseases or they shouldn't even be anyone's diseases. Right. Mm -hmm. But, um, I think that sometimes was a motivating factor for families when they realized their child, that was a big motivator when they realized that there's these comorbidities that go along with having excess weight and it's reversible. Like, that get me on board. Let's, let's try to fix this. Can you, can you, you, you mentioned the um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Can you speak for a second about that? Uh, just for our listeners that yeah. want to know kind of, cause that's seriously on the rise here. A lot of us know about, you know, um, uh, cirrhosis from alcohol, yeah. right? but from non-alcohol, like, can you explain that? Yeah. So alcohol used to be the number one cause of liver disease, and now it's obesity. So it, it's a comorbidity, which means they happen together. So at, when you see a rise in obesity, you also see a rise in these other conditions that are comorbidities, the type two diabetes, the fatty liver disease. So fatty liver is literally an accumulation of fat in the liver and um, it leads to inflammation and then that leads to scarring. And before the scarring phase, it's reversible. So mm -hmm. if you have early fatty liver disease or um, steatohepatitis is a fancy name for it, where you have a lot of inflammation, those conditions are reversible. Can you, but see, once, can you see this or how do you diagnose it? Um, the first thing you can see is on a laboratory test, you'll see elevated liver enzymes. They're called AST and ALT. And when those are elevated above a certain amount, the doctor will order an ultrasound and it will test for the elasticity of the liver to see how much inflammation and cirrhosis is in the liver. Um, and then they can do biopsies. But the, um, the great thing about changing to a healthy diet um, is, is the ability to reverse this condition. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's incredible to me how resilient our bodies are, how much, how much assault and pounding that it can take. But as you said, up to a certain point, and then you cannot actually, you know, reverse, right. you can still make some, some great, I think efforts, but tell me this, uh, in your, in what you were able to see typically, what's like the youngest age that you saw scarring in somebody's liver? Can that happen as early as 15? I didn't, i never saw scarring okay. in the pediatric population. Yeah. Kids yeah. are super resilient. So when they're having, you know, um, fatty liver disease, they're getting, er it's early. So I don't, I don't know if it's possible to have that kind of scarring just from um, a poor diet. Right, right. I did not see that. Right. Good and plenty and burgers and shakes. <laughs> um, <laughs> you also, you started the first vegetable garden at Hasbro. Is that, do you know if that's still there and what inspired you to start it? Um, I just love gardening and I just thought it would be really fantastic to show kids where vegetables come from and how they could grow a garden mm -hmm. too if they were so inspired in their urban backyards. Uh, it took five years to get um, the administration at the hospital to agree. But what I did was we did six different beds. Each one was a different color of the rainbow. So we called it the Hasbro Rainbow Garden. So there was like, you know, 
purple, blue, green, orange, yellow, red. So we had red tomatoes and orange pumpkins and yellow squash. And then we had a teepee in each bed with ribbons of the colors of the rainbow and annuals to help with pollination that were all in the colors of the rainbow. So it was very colorful and educational. And we definitely integrated it into the clinic. It was right outside the clinic doors and the um, health clinic. That's really, really cool. I can't believe it took you five years. But yeah, you, there were some people that were concerned in, in the administration. Oh my gosh. You know, it's funny. I, I saw a, a quote this morning, and it's, um, it's hard to beat a person who never gives up. And that's Babe Ruth. Um, so way to go on never, never giving up. It kind of reminds me of one of my favorite movies is The Shawshank Redemption, <laughs> where he keeps uh, sending a letter to the warden because he wants to put a library uh, in the prison. And finally he, he grants him permission. So, yeah. Reminds me of your garden. <laughs> um, so you mentioned you love gardening. You also love yoga. How long have you been doing yoga? Hmm. Oh, like forever. I feel like <laughs> I probably started doing it formally in, in residency. So mm -hmm. 25, wow. 30 years ago. Nice. Yeah. Nice. I just, I just got back from a retreat where I did it every morning for six days in a row. And nice. It's just, it's a reminder to me how much I love yoga in the nineties. I did it three times a week for probably, I don't know, five years in the middle of the nineties. And my body just so like needs it, especially, yeah. especially as I'm getting older. It's great. There's a, is a fun little yoga game with a spinner and you spin it. And then there's these cards that show kids how to do different yoga poses and yeah. we, I, I got that for the, um, the obesity clinic and we would play it. I would always have, we'd have like an education piece and then like an exercise piece. So that was one of the fun things we did was play the yoga game. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I also see that you're into sweater alchemy. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> um, it's, well, it's my name. I made it up. So, <laughs> okay, good. So, so don't feel bad, <laughs> but I, um, I have this passion for um, for the whole trash to treasure concept. Um, I think it's being brought up by parents of the depression where you don't throw anything out. And I collect sweaters that someone might throw out because they have moth holes in them, but they're like good fibers, wool, cashmere, alpaca. Yeah, yeah. And then I shrink them, I wash and dry them so the they don't come unraveled. And then I cut them up and make other things out of them, like mittens or blankets. <laughs> very, very cool. So you, you mentioned um, trash to treasure. I was just listening to something yesterday. It was talking about fecal transplants mm -hmm. and how one person's trash is another person's treasure. <laughs> Relating to that, <laughs> but have you do you have you heard much about uh, fecal transplants lately? And as far as like what it can do for ulcerative colitis and autoimmune diseases and things of that nature, uh, it like one of my favorite topics is the gut biome. I just think it is so fascinating, and I think we're just the tip of the iceberg in understanding. Yeah like the power of the gut biome. I think it has a huge role in metabolism, autoimmune diseases, um, obesity. And I don't, I don't know the answer to your question, but I would be fascinated to read about it. I think, um, you know, fecal transplants is just fascinating how it can fix, um, yeah. you know, I think what's most famous and best known in the literature is when you have um, C. diff. Yes. It's like an overgrowth of this bad kind of bacteria in your gut. And, and you have to use these super powerful antibiotics, which is why it happens to begin with, right? You go on antibiotics, it kills your good bacteria. The C. diff overgrows out of control. Then you have to use a more powerful antibiotic and it's developing all this resistance. So like some people die of this because they can't kill off the bad bacteria. So then they end up getting a fecal transplant with someone's good bacteria and, and it just fixes it overnight. It's yeah. fascinating. Oh, it's remarkable because I'm, I'm ignorant with this topic and I don't want to go too deep into it. Um, but how do you do a fecal transplant? Is it oral? Is it rectal? Do you have any idea? <laughs> <laughs> I actually, 
actually, I think it's oral, but I, I think they're like capsules yeah. that don't open until they're in the gut, but I really don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, well, I don't think that's how they used to do it. I think it used to be more, I, I don't know, up the butt, but I don't know. <laughs> right. Well, I think it's gotten more sophisticated. <laughs> well, if they're if they're looking for um, uh, you know somebody that's got a healthy microbiome uh, and you know healthy stools, uh, I think you know we need to sign up somewhere for <laughs> for people that need uh, that that need our Good our tra area. need our trash, which is will be their treasure. <laughs> well, one thing I do like to teach our participants is you can change your gut bacteria. It shifts as you change your diet. So what you eat feeds your, your bacteria. So if you're eating a bunch of stuff with preservatives um, and, you know, like ultra processed foods, it makes sense that that's going to kill off a lot of the good bacteria and only a few strains of this more unhealthy bacteria will grow. But if you feed yourself all kinds of diverse fruits and vegetables and um, fermented foods, then you're giving your gut like a lot of um, different kinds of bacteria and you're feeding the good ones that will grow more and be favorable to your health. It's, yeah. it's fascinating. It, it is. And I've had uh, Dr. Will Bolshewitz uh, on the podcast. I've had Dr. Robin Shutkan. So, you know, both gastroenterologists that you know, 15 years ago, didn't even really weren't talking about this. And as you said, we literally are, I think, just scratching the surface when it comes yeah. to the microbiome and the trillions and trillions and trillions of bacteria that we can cultivate there that can really help raise our, our health. Um, I want to, I want to transition right now. I'm going to start with this quote that's actually on your, your plant docs, uh, website and the food that you eat can either be the safest, most powerful form of medicine or the slowest form of poison. That's Ann Wigmore. Um, so you, during the pandemic, was it 2021, you decided you were going to unhinge yourself from kind of traditional medicine and, uh, and start your own plant docs providence with yourself and two other physicians. Tell me about that and what's going on with it. Yeah, I love that quote. We start every program with that quote. Um, yeah, and it, it, it literally defines what I do now. But in 2019, I met up with Kim Anderson, who's the owner of and co-founder and creator of Plant City, which is a food, um, whole food plant-based um, food hall in Providence, Rhode Island. And she had this idea to start, you know, to have, well, th they have like Plant City Cellar. So there's all kinds of programs in the cellar space. They have um, documentary showings and cooking classes. And I, you know, she suggested I could do some kind of, of a jumpstart where we took a group of people, taught them how to eat whole food, plant-based, no oil, grab labs before and after, to really show people the impact that it can have. And uh, I love the idea. So I kind of got together this business called Plant Docs. And this was in 2019 when Plant oh. City opened. And so we were all doing it as like a side thing. And, but all of us, we were all like, this is like the most rewarding thing we've ever done in our career. In like one short month, we're changing these people's lives and we're not prescribing drugs or, mm -hmm. you know, surgery. We're just showing them how to eat healthy and seeing these kind of miraculous turnarounds in health. And some of them are like the type two diabetes and prediabetes, that stuff it's amazing how the cells just start working when you stop giving, you know, animal fat and animal protein and all the oils and you start eating all these um, nourishing foods, the cells start working, the insulin receptors start working. And um, within like a, a week, people need to adjust their insulin dosages. So um, yeah, we were like, this is great. But then COVID started, we had like a big hiatus of 14 months because we were cooking and eating together and it just didn't seem, you know, it wasn't um, okay to do that. So when we started up again, we created a hybrid program based on, you know, social spacing and mask wearing. 
And we had the in-person part was we would wear masks and just have the education for, for two of the classes. And the other two would be fully remote. And we had people cook in their own kitchen. I would send out the ingredients and we would show, we would cook with them and show them um, how to cook. And we would make a breakfast, lunch, and a dinner together. And the feedback we got was that they liked that better. People were empowered to, they had to go out and buy these ingredients. They weren't just watching us do it and then eating it. So we ended up keeping that model. And, um, and then, yeah, I was, it was in 2021 that I decided, you know, I just want to do this. This is really where my heart lies. And um, I, I, gave my notice and left my job halfway through 21, kind of when the residents switch yeah. in June. So I finished off one class and then I just dove right into this. I did this, um, Harvard has this great um, culinary coaching class, chef coaching. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna learn a little more professional how to teach, um, I'm not a chef, but how to teach culinary nutrition and cooking. Um, and we I've just been running with it ever since. Um, is that, is that, is that um, course that you did with Harvard? Is it plant centric or animal centric? It's pre, it's Mediterranean centric. Uh -huh. So it, it's, it was mostly, I think most, actually most of the recipes were plant-based. They weren't oil free. Um, I don't think there was any chicken or fish actually. Mm -hmm. Um, it was mostly bean, legumes, fennel, lemon soup. Um, it was very good. Yeah. Good. <laughs> yeah. And so Plant Docs is, it, so is it affiliated with Plant City or is it nearby or you just kind of use the cellar to do jump starts and stuff? Is that right? We started by using the cellar and um, Kim gave us an office there in the basement and she, you know, it's a real synergistic relationship because we're teaching people the um, power of eating a whole food plant-based diet to heal and as a lifestyle. And she's providing this restaurant with four different, you know, restaurants in a marketplace. So after the pandemic, um, you know, I think she loves having us there and we love being there. So um, I, ha I still have an office there and I run the in-person programs there, but we offer all of our programs are now um, with the option to be fully remote because we have people from all over the country participating in our jump starts. Uh -huh. So every time that we have a jump start, 20 spaces are remote, fully remote, and 20 spaces are for people who want to come into Plant City. Why do you limit the remote to 20? Um because we're ordering labs before and after, and I thought it might be too overwhelming to follow everything. It's very um, concierge. -y. So people email me and call me whenever they want to during the program. They'll, they'll send me texts from the supermarket, like, what do you think of this product? And, and that's what I want everyone to be successful. And if I have too many people, I worry that it's gonna lose that, you mm. know, Th that kind of attention. Well, that's, that's, that's remarkable. That's really high touch, lots of attention. You get great results with that. So yeah. Yeah. Way to, way to be with that. Um, and the other two, two docs that are part of plant docs, um, what, what are their backgrounds? Were they They're in both family physicians uh -huh. and they both went to a lifestyle medicine conference. That's a, a number of years ago. That's how they got introduced to the power of kind of whole food plant-based eating. And so they joined me um, in the very beginning. We, we all co-founded it together. And their role now is um, primarily with the jumpstart your health programs, the one month programs, they all, they teach it with me and, um, you know, we have different personalities. So there's a nice balance um, between some of us who are more um, strict and some that are more um, funny. <laughs> so um, I think we have a good thing going, but I'm primarily in the plant docs um, business. I'm doing all the consultations and I started a monthly cooking class last year in, in 22 using Dr. Greger's How Not to Die cookbook because I wanted to use recipes that were all, you know, no oil 
and yeah. teach people. And, and it was kind of meant to be like a support group for, for our Jumpstart graduates. So they could sign on for these cooking classes. But this year we're doing these plant-based global health um, cooking. And I'm having a lot of guest chefs from different countries. I have like a co, um, a colleague of mine who's Indian and she did a, an Indian cuisine one in February. So we're having yeah. a lot of fun with it. Don't you have, you have one coming up, if I'm not mistaken, that's uh, based on, was it Okinawa? Yeah, it, that was last weekend. Oh. So we're visiting all the um, all the blue zones of the world, yeah. and and I do a little education. Each country, we do a little education about kind of the food from that country, and um, and then how to make something fun and tasty from that region. Yeah, and in, in seeing Dan Butner's um, lecture. He, he came to uh, one of our, our plant stocks a couple of years ago. You know, the one overlapping thing with all of the blue zones are the legumes, mm -hmm. which, is, which is pretty darn cool. Mm -hmm. And of course, very plant centric and all that good, good jazz. Uh, yeah, it's fascinating. I love, I loved reading about the blue zones. So I really wanted to incorporate it just positive, you know, healthy longevity. It's yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask you a question. You can tell me to jump off a cliff uh, <laughs> if you want. Uh, but I'm just wondering, like, you know, based upon what you were doing with traditional medicine and probably I would imagine the salary that you were making, are you able to make a living as a plant-based doctor? Not yet. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, yeah, I'm at, not yeah. at all. And yeah. like it, when we first started, it, it was like a side gig. So we were just kind of running a couple of jump starts here and there. Then there was COVID. So then I've been doing it now for almost two years. And, you know, I, I haven't figured out how to make a living. Um, in the fall of last year, I did a like a we have a something in Providence called the Social Enterprise Greenhouse. And they help businesses with um, social agendas to get off the ground. So I did that for a semester. So that took a lot of my time, but um, was very valuable. And it was helped connect me to a lot of people in the community and learn how to grow a business and um, connect me with lawyers and you know other people that I didn't have connections with. And so during that time, I switched it from an LLC to a nonprofit because I feel like the mission of Plant Ox is more nonprofit oriented. Like I, I want to educate everyone. I don't want to make money. So, I mean, I do, would like, I would like to get paid for what I do. Um, I'm working on that, but um, I think we're going to have to rely on grants and funding to supplement what people can pay because the, um, I don't want to charge. If I charged what the actual cost of the class was, it would be too much for people to afford. So I want to keep it affordable. No, um, it's incredible to me. I saw like you do your jump starts and for the month and I am imagining it's including labs. It's like $250. It's, it's yeah, no, the labs are paid for by their insurance company, but it no. includes like a doctor consultation, you know, no. and all the, the cooking classes and, and in-person classes. Yeah. And, and we also have one coming up in June. That's going to be a Providence community health center, which is an inner city population and they're not going to pay anything. So we're hoping, I'm hoping this will all fall into place, but I'm, I'm hoping to get some grant money to cover that. And then they all have issues with food insecurity too. So they're all going to leave each day with a bag of food. Um, mm. And that's going to be fully in person. So that's the beauty of it being nonprofit is to, to try to access these communities that need this information, but are, there's nobody um, teaching it. And it's also going to be bilingual, that course in wow. Spanish and in English. Do you, do you speak Spanish? I don't, but I, I've, I've met another doctor who's bilingual, who's going to teach it with me. And we have a Latino medical student from um, Brown medical student. Who's going to yeah. translate all my slides um, into Spanish and English, and she's going to help teach it too. So, right. Yeah, yeah. The thing, the thing to me, that's just so it's unfortunate is that, you know, you decide to leave traditional medicine because it has so many limitations and go into this basically lifestyle medicine 
And right now, the way that the whole model is set up, you cannot make a legitimate living doing that. And yet it's the one way that you are getting to the root causation and really, really helping people. It's just it's so unfortunate. It, yes, I agree. I mean, I could, I could open a lifestyle medicine practice and take insurance and do, you know, but then you have to follow this traditional model of billing and time slots. And, and that's what I really wanted to get away from. I, I didn't want anyone telling me like how to do what I'm doing. I want to spend the amount of time I need to spend to get people to be successful, to reverse their disease. I don't want to, I don't want to be told you only have 15 minutes and you have to bill a nine, nine, two, one, three. And, and yes, you're going to get paid a whole lot more money, but I'm not going to be successful at my goal, which is helping patients to reverse their disease. Mm -hmm. Can you, can you do, uh, you and your other docs that are part of plant docs do nutritional consults with anyone across the United States, or is it limited to where you practice medicine? Um, I can do them with anyone. Wow. That's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. And so what's the best way that for somebody that's listening that wants to do a consult with you, where should they go? Um, my website is plant docs, PVD, PVD. It's, I shouldn't have kept this. It's a little confusing to people who don't live in Providence, but anyone who lives in Providence knows that P V is in Victor D is in dog stands for Providence, but I wasn't aware that no one else knows that. <laughs> Yeah. But so anyway, my website is plantdocspvd.com. And on there is all our, um, you know, information about our programs that are upcoming, the cooking classes, the consultations. And the other thing that I've um, kind of took a dive into over the last year is, is the world of cancer. Um, mm. I was asked to do a cancer class for breast cancer survivors by a local um, breast cancer resource organization called the Gloria Gemma Foundation. And after doing that, I, I realized like, oh my goodness, there's so much important information out here for cancer survivors or people at high risk for cancer. So I'm running a program a couple times a year that's fully remote. It's information about the most powerful anti-cancer foods out there and how to make like a healthy dinner with them. Wow. So can, those, you, can you like tease me and tell me like, what would you say are the top three or four anti-cancer foods? Yeah, I, I mean, mushrooms always just jumps to my head, all different kinds of mushrooms, the whole allium family, onions, and, you know, garlic are super powerful. Broccoli sprouts are probably one of the most powerful anti cancer foods. They're oh, like snap. way more concentrated than broccoli. Um, the sulforaphane that's in them is is a super powerful um, anti cancer um, molecule. So yeah. and then the berries. Those would be my, my top four picks. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm just thinking here. I haven't had a mushroom in a couple of days, so I need to get uh -oh. more mushrooms. I, <laughs> I, I have a problem with the texture of most mushrooms. Um, and then uh, broccoli sprouts. You know, I had Doug Evans on my show. I don't know if you know who Doug is. He's Mr. He, he wrote the Sprout book. Oh. Um, and, uh, and he talked all about sulforaphane and you know, all these other things that are there and, you know, like broccoli sprouts and why sprouting, everybody should do it and how easy it is. And I still haven't done it. So I, I, it's a nice reminder for me. <laughs> you can add them to salads or even do a smoothie. Yes. Um, and sproutman.com has this new powder if for mm. people who don't like the taste of sprouts. That's 100% food that you can add to smoothies. And while we're on that topic, mushroom powder if you hate mushrooms you can buy like real food mushroom powder i actually have it every morning in my coffee oh, oh. i know a lot of people think it's weird but it's called mud water mud, it's that's great you know and i just love it i put it in my coffee with my my frothed oat milk and um yeah, yeah. and my turmeric powder <laughs> do you know what kind of mushrooms this mushroom powder comes from um, yeah, there's like four or five. There's reishi mushrooms, cordyceps, lion mane. They have a whole bunch in there. Oh, now you're talking my language. Reishis and lion's manes? Holy Toledo. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do you, um, during the day? Do you snack? And if so, what do you like to snack on? Um, fruit is 
when I do, I love using the Dr. Greger's um, Daily Dozen app. And when I like check myself to see how good or bad am I eating, I, I'm usually deficient in fruit, which is funny because I love fruit. So when I, when I snack, I usually have some fruit and a handful of nuts. Yeah. Well, just so you know, I've already had a cup of berries. It's a frozen blend that I have. It's, you know, relatively cheap. I had a banana on my cereal, the berries. I also had stra sliced strawberries and a mango. And I'm going to have this mango, the champagne mango. Love those. Oh, yeah. And it's so perfectly ripe. I'm going to have these are the sumo orange, which just feel easily. I'm going to have these two little squatty bananas that I'm going to have as well during the the afternoon and i on your website i saw you guys talking about the mango and how there's like 500 to a thousand different varieties of mangoes i know it's i feel crazy, like i know we only, i know me too so what kind of cereal did you have was it a oh, big bowl? um yeah thank you for asking that question <laughs> no it's <laughs> it is my commercialized rips big bowl cereal and it was the berry <laughs> almond this morning and i just love it i have it so six delicious. mornings a week yeah yeah um <laughs> so one of the things i noticed in in perusing through your website is you've got the plant docs and then separating plant and docs you have this uh, great asparagus that's going up and then around the asparagus is the, is the snake, right? That yeah. is, is that the, the medical? Yeah. It's like a medical yeah. icon. Yeah. And, and then you also talk about how, and I just found it to be fascinating because I find a, asparagus to be such a fascinating vegetable is how um, it's a perennial. So it comes, comes out every year and and you can have a plot of asparagus that can last for 15 to 20 years. That just was blew my mind. Yeah. So every time I move, the first thing I do is plant asparagus. <laughs> yeah. And I know this is a very personal question, but does asparagus make your urine smell? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, probably. <laughs> I think that means that to me that means no, because you would know it is so potent. <laughs> Uh, I think it's another Babe Ruth uh, thing is something about asparagus and urine. But anyway, I can't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sandy, this has been an absolute blast. I, I, I am so impressed with your commitment and what you've done there with plant docs and, you know, all things related to lifestyle medicine. Huge congrats. And, um, Again, anybody that's interested, their jump starts, start, jump start programs look incredible. Um, go to plant, plant docs, spvd.com and check out all the great resources they have. Um, but, and the reason I found out about you, Sandy, just before we close this out is because my sister Jane uh, was there at, at plant city with you. And she, I think gave a lecture. She was signing yeah. books with plant based, yeah. be a plant based woman warrior. And, uh, and she, I actually talked to her this morning and she remarked, you know, how fantastic you are. And, uh, she wanted me to tell you hello as well. Oh, thank you. Yeah. We loved having her and we look forward to your visit as well. <laughs> good. good <laughs> if good, I can good. convince you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, Sandy, have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much for joining uh, joining me on the Plant Strong Podcast. Thank you for having me. I oh, loved yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> my pleasure. Um, anything you want to say as we close out our uh, our conversation today? My my one thing I always want to just reiterate is I want people to know that there that some of these conditions are reversible. These chronic conditions are reversible um, by changing your diet. And I think a lot of people think like once they're on medication, that that's it. And, and they're going to be on it for life. But it's possible to get off these statins and high blood pressure meds by changing your diet and working with your doctor to kind of move in that direction away from meds. Yeah. All right, Sandy, can you hit me with a fist bump here? Ooh. Keep it plant strong. <laughs> yes, indeed. Sandy is available for consultations and she is launching a whole new Jumpstart Your Health four week program in September that can be done remotely. As Sandy likes to say, you have a choice to have a daily rebirth of sorts 
and it's never too late to build a whole new you. The good news, she and all of us here at Plan Strong are here to help. We'll be sure to link to Sandy's website in the show notes of this episode. Thanks so much for listening and sharing the Plan Strong podcast. Thank you for listening to the Plan Strong podcast. You can support the show by taking a quick minute to follow us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Leaving us a positive review and sharing the show with your network is another great way to help us reach as many people as possible with the exciting news about plants. Thank you in advance for your support. It means everything. The Plant Strong Podcast team includes Carrie Barrett, Lori Kordowich, Amy Mackey, Patrick Gavin, and Wade Clark. This season is dedicated to all of those courageous truth seekers who weren't afraid to look through the lens with clear vision and hold firm to a higher truth. Most notably, my parents, Dr. Caldwell B. Esselstyn Jr. and Anne Cryle Esselstyn. Thanks for listening.